So yeah, the conversation we're having now is based on the very high profile potential takeover of Twitter by Elon Musk and the sense that a lot of us had. So I'm joined by Jim and Aaron, who I'll introduce in a second. And we've been having a sort of a conversation about what the, the current debate is kind of missing, which seems to be kind of splitting on the, along the sort of typical political lines and the sort of free speech censorship. And that there's a sort of deeper dimension of kind of the questions of moderation, the questions of creating online, healthy online communities and why they go wrong that I know both of, both of my guests have been thinking about for a lot of time and also have real world experience in. Jim Rutt it will be familiar to a lot of our viewers. Jim has been in, involved in online communities for a long time, former head of the Santa Fe Institute, and has just published an article for Quillette called Must, Musk and Moderation. Welcome, Jim. Um, what are you offering with the, the article and what do you want to talk about in this conversation? Hey, well, thanks for uh, having me on, David. Always enjoyed chatting. Uh, so the article uh, is fairly long and hits on a lot of pieces, but I'm going to focus in this uh, summary on the upfront part, and I think is the uh, the most important uh, and new addition I, I hoped to add to the dialogue. Uh, you know, soon as uh, the Musk story started to build and the probability increased, uh, I saw a tremendous amount of puerile and anodyne argument on both sides that were absolutist, you know, moderation, no, moderation, yes, et cetera. And as a person who literally helped invent the field when I went to work for The Source, which was the world's first consumer online service in 1980 and actually designed and uh, ran uh, some of the earliest online communities and many online communities since, uh, that's absurd. Uh, you know, you cannot have an online community without moderation. Uh, and there's, uh, but to just, try, you know, to deal with the, the idea of moderation in the whole is, uh, is, is too broad. So I came up with a uh, tripart model where I talk about uh, the distinctions uh, between uh, decorum mod moderation, content moderation, and viewpoint moderation. And I offered uh, some definitions and uh, some specific uh, examples and uh, why decorum moderation is essential, uh, why content moderation needs to be narrowly and precisely uh, circumscribed, but is necessary as well. And that viewpoint moderation, uh, which is uh, what the payload of the message is essentially, uh, should, we should be very reticent to engage in. Uh, further, uh, it's my belief, I don't know the man, so I could be wrong, but it's my belief that what Elon actually cares about is viewpoint moderation, uh, that, that all points of view, the substance, uh, is available in the public square uh, to be debated, to be upregulated, to be downregulated based on the quality of the ideas, how it resonates with people, how the ideas are built upon by other people, uh, you know, all the ways that, uh, uh, that collectively humans process the new uh, and, uh, and the old and uh, come to decide uh, how to build our civilization forward in its next step, because our civilization is always unfolding into a, into a future. And uh, I also have a very specific idea, uh, which I call the green shoots hypothesis, uh, why it's so essential not to stifle the ideas at the fringe, uh, which is that uh, just as biology is based on mutation and talk to any evolutionary theorist, and I talked to one yesterday, and he'll tell you 99.9% .9 of mutations are deleterious. They're bad for the offspring. However, without mutations, we'd still be single cell bacteria. Uh, the, all the progress in biology came from that uh, one in 1000 mutation that was actually good and then got passed on by a natural selection. Uh, I would suggest the same is true uh, with respect to uh, social unfolding is that, uh, you know, Sturgeon's Law, famous law from the 60s by a science fiction writer, uh, said 90% of everything is shit. Uh, he probably underestimated, at least on the internet. Uh, but that's okay. It was 99% is shit. 1% uh, are the ideas that will save us. And if we uh, arbitrarily squelch anything that is contrary to the status quo narrative, you know, that upsets conventional wisdom, et cetera, 
our social progress will stop and due to the second law of thermodynamics, which is that everything runs down over time, we'll start to move backwards. And that's why uh, I am in alignment, I believe, with Elon, that point of view um, uh, censorship or moderation should be done with extreme reluctance. I mean, will I say never? No, never say never, but I would say that uh, with extreme reluctance. So now let me switch back to the part that I believe Elon does not yet get and subsequent tweets he has made since my essay was written, uh, you know, raise my eyebrow a little bit that uh, maybe Elon doesn't get this and he needs to read my, uh, uh, my article, God damn it. Uh, which is that decorum moderation is absolutely indispensable uh, to the successful operation of online communities. And again, I literally have been doing this for 41 years uh, across every platform before the internet, uh, in the early days of the internet, and up through the rise of the internet. Uh, and uh, with, you know, without uh, moderation, the, uh, uh, the um, conversation goes to shit. I want to kind of park the elephant in the room that we'll come back to in a second, which is this kind of um, the nature of kind of moderation versus censorship, because it's such a hot topic online. And I think we need to kind of grasp that before we move on. But I'd like to start by introducing Aaron. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, how you doing? Um, thanks for having me on. So, Aaron, yeah, thank you for joining us. You're a philosopher. You're the host of the Embrace the Void podcast, um, and you've written a lot about free speech and content moderation in the past. And you've also kind of put your money where your mouth is with a fascinating article, which I'd highly recommend people to read. I'll put it in the show notes about Monster Island, which was a kind of unmoderate, unmoderated place that you set up in the aftermath of the 2016 election. I'd love to hear a little bit about that and just, just maybe your framing before we go into the conversation as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say thanks for having me on because as we will find out, I love robust disagreement. And I think I have some robust disagreements with y'all, but I also think I have, uh, it sounds like some valuable agreements in terms of the need for content moderation um, and also the recognition that content moderation is extremely difficult. Um, I want to say, Jim, you know, thank you for your service. Uh, anyone who spent time in moderation trenches um, to me is, is someone worth having a conversation with. Um, and I, you know, I read your article and um, I sort of like the overall tone, though I'm concerned. I think I have some uh, issues with specifically, I think, trying to separate out content and point of view. Um, and maybe it's a debate about the examples that you use, but we can definitely get into that. Um, to give folks a little bit about my background, like you said, I'm a philosopher. I specifically am a moral philosopher who's interested in moral education, primarily issues around luck, both moral luck and epistemic luck. Um, and by extension, I'm interested in skepticism about things like conspiracy theories and the way that people can get sucked into um, kind of conspiracism spirals. Um, and then my background in terms of like the pseudo applied version of all of this is back during the Trump election, I was still arguing a lot on Facebook. I hadn't gotten on Twitter very much. And I had been put in touch with a couple of very conservative individuals who also wanted to argue. And we were doing a lot of like debating on our walls on Twitter. And I was getting messages from friends like, can you desperately please put this somewhere else? Um, so we created Monster Island, which was a closed private Facebook group for people who wanted to argue with no content moderation rules, essentially. So the goal was you know, simultaneously to create a space where we could do this far away from normies and not ruin their lives. But also I, you know, was interested in testing an idea that I think was dominant at that time and continues to be fairly dominant in a lot of um, online ecosystems, which is a kind of free speech absolutism, this idea that you really could live without content moderation. Um, and I was curious to see how that would work in this environment where people were actually seriously disagreeing with each other. So we created a space where there were no official rules about content. There was only norms that would be enforced by individuals. Um, and at, like we, what we tried to see as long as we could go without making rules, which was not very long. Immediately, we had to start making rules because people were doxing each other. People were, um, you know, we had to make a rule preventing people from posting pictures of each other's loved ones, having sex with dictators, usual internet kind of things. Um, and it 
what was really interesting about it, that, that part is not particularly surprising, I don't think, but it, you know, you have to do the science to prove it anyway. Um, but what was interesting was the spiral that happens when you start making the rules, which is there's always this kind of red queen um, escalation between people trying to moderate and people trying to, for whatever reasons, test the bounds of those moderations, usually for antisocial reasons, usually for their own entertainment. Um, and so the content got really, you know, never got really good to begin with, unfortunately, and stayed generally pretty bad throughout. Um, and eventually I gave up on it. And then a year or two later, we shut the group down because one of the members, a person who I had argued with many times, who had talked many times about how it was good that people were getting out into the streets and fighting over race, uh, was involved in the Kenosha shooting. Um, he was the he, he cited in the reports as being the tactical advisor for Kyle Rittenhouse's group. Um, obviously, there was a lot of backtracking by them after things, but that's that was a weird connection. Um, that was sort of a stark reminder that the internet is real life, and what people say on the internet tracks into their behavior in real life. Um, so the, the big takeaway for me that I talked about in the article is, you know, a pushback on this free speech mantra that sunlight is the best disinfectant or that we can really just get it all out in the open and solve these problems. You know, in my opinion, there's two things wrong with the sunlight is the best disinfectant view. If you want to take that kind of metaphor, the first is that we conflate something being promoted widely with it being exposed to sunlight, which is not true. Many things get spread very widely without them facing much sunlight because sunlight moves slower than the spread. And we all know this to be the case. And it's why um, you know, people who do work in misinformation will emphasize that prevention is worth way more than any attempts at putting the, the problem back in the bottle. The other being that if you wanna use the biological evolution model, Jim, which I'm, I'm not totally opposed to using, I think it's important to understand that certain ideas are weaponized anthrax and that like exposing them to mutations is not a good idea. They should be kept in a lab and like heavily guarded and like not spread in these kind of ways. And I, my, 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 main, my main concern with your article was, for example, you put QAnon in the point of view box rather than the content box. And I think that either doesn't understand what QAnon is or suggests a major problem with those two boxes. And this I think is indicative of a larger problem with heterodox communities, online communities, YouTube, lots of different places where in a genuine desire to seek truth and avoid shunning error, um, given a prior history of too much shunning of error, I think folks lean too much towards seeking truth and it leaves them vulnerable to really dangerous misinformation and conspiracies, especially from right-wing sources um, that, you know, they let in because they're trying to be open to that one idea that might be really valuable. So that's where I'm at. And um, hopefully this can all come across in, in good faith um, because I do appreciate the work that y'all are doing. Yeah, so there's plenty that I think uh, Jim and Aaron, you can kind of spark off each other in a, in a minute, but I just want to grapple with that elephant in the room now, which is, I found since being on, on YouTube, like the free speech absolutism is close to a religion on, on YouTube, especially in the comments thread. And I think it's worth addressing that, that sort of why is any moderation needed? The, the idea of censorship is so taboo. I mean, I, I can understand why, and the arguments tend to be sort of steel manning. The cure for any bad speech is good speech, is more speech. Um, the censorship is a slippery slope. And who would you trust with the power of deciding what's accepted and what isn't? And all of those are very valid concerns, really important concerns. And I think we, we've seen what goes wrong when people without any kind of accountability make those decisions. So it's, it's a very strong position. But one thing that strikes me is like we're in an environment of information war. We're on the verge of AI created infinite amounts of bullshit. Like just those two facts alone should, I think, give us pause to, to think that things can become self-moderating. I don't think they will be self-moderating. I think it's a, I think those perspectives are understandable, but for me, it's an ideological position that is at best unproven in the world that good speech will drown out bad speech. Um, and as two people who've got a lot of experience of, of seeing how this plays out online, yeah, I'd be interested if each of you in turn could like steel man the position of, of, of why moderation of any kind is, is so taboo 
and also why you think that 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 if you think that's a, a naive or an incomplete perspective why you think it's an incomplete perspective uh sure i'll start um i think you actually did a pretty good job you know basically comes down to uh you know who makes the standards uh you know how is it adjudicated and why should x's opinion uh triumph over y's opinion uh and i think you know those are all uh, good arguments with respect to viewpoint uh, moderation, uh, actually. And again, to my green shoots hypothesis that we can't say in advance which ideas are good ones. Uh, example, uh, I don't think I used it in the uh, paper, but I used it in a long discussion on Facebook yesterday, which is even, uh, you know, Curtis Yarvin's ideas about monarchism. Uh, you know, I think they're bad ideas, but he presents them in a good faith fashion. And uh, uh, you know, why should I or anybody else say that Curtis Yarvin's uh, proposal that we should replace democracy with monarchism uh, not circulate? Maybe he's right. I, you know, I don't think that we should assume that uh, first past the post uh, uh, elections every four years, democracy is the end point of uh, social system evolution. And so I'm very, very reticent uh, to suppress the ideas themselves. But again, uh, as I said in the introduction, the key error the absolutists make uh, is to not make the distinction between decorum, particularly, and viewpoint and content, uh, where decorum breaks down our ability to have reasoned discussion. And very importantly, it introduces what has become known in the uh, uh, freer speech uh, space as the heckler's veto. Uh, because of the nature of the bandwidth, especially online, where it's one thing after another, uh, if you have a heckler in bad faith uh, attacking people, just putting in crap, uh, the conversation breaks down all the, uh, the people who are interesting and smart go somewhere else. And so the heckler has the ability to punish speakers they disagree with and destroy the speech. And, and decorum has to uh, be the tool we use against that. And, you know, give a few, put a little bit more meat on the bones of decorum. Uh, you, know, you know, examples could be no personal attacks. In one of my online systems, we have that rule. And we have a death penalty version of it. Any personal attack that uses an obscene word targeted to another user, you will be expelled with no appeal instantly, right? Uh, and uh, other ones, uh, you know, are... Um, uh, Can I... Yeah, hop in there. Actually, actually, I don't ask you about this, Jim, because I think this is um, one issue where I think there's a challenge, which is this, how do you talk about people? What things are you allowed to say about people and not just ideas? And I don't think it's as clear cut. Um, you know, like, I think we can agree, you know, not cursing at people, great, um, fine. But like, am I allowed to say that a person's view is racist? Am I allowed to say that I think their view is extremely dangerous um, and harmful? Am I allowed to say that I think that their view shouldn't be part of the debate within our community? Uh, related to this, and this, I think this gets to the viewpoint um, concern that I have, you, you bring up Yarvin there as another example. I, I think it would be harmful, right, to talk about Yarvin, like one of Yarvin's ideas and not talk about his larger project and the, the implications of that project gains prominence and the way that that, you know, that that project has influenced people like James Lindsay and stuff, that it has had a substantial impact on a lot of regressive elements. Um, I think folks who are lean towards the kind of free speech absolutist position because they're nervous about ad hominem attacks, they're also nervous about talking about ideas as part of a larger body of work. Um, and they're, they're nervous sometimes I've found, and this I think um, I will say specifically is true of, of both of y'all, that like y'all have in the past platformed individuals who have very specifically harmful views and mostly talked to them about other stuff, um, which may not necessarily be directly connected to those views, but that that can be problematic if your viewers get the impression from that conversation that you think that this person is uh, a good source of information and then they go and look at their other content and they come across anti-vaxxer content or something like that, that that is uh, a problem that is harder to address if we're not able to talk about how, you know, someone, how, how one person's views on this thing are connected to their views on something else or are connected in other ways through them as an individual. So 
uh, I, you know, I think it's, we have to be careful at every stage of the kinds of content that you're talking about, the kinds of moderation that you're talking about, not to think that there's an easy answer. I think there's hard questions about decorum. And I think at the end of the day, there's really only one other category, which is content. And content has to be understood broadly there. And it can include to what what's, what seems like to some people, things like guilt by association or you know, over assuming or pattern matching or something like that. And let me speak to a directly experience we had on the well. Uh, you know, the well is probably the oldest surviving well.com for those of you who are interested. And I should, in full disclosure, say I am a small minority owner of the well. Uh, it's been running since 1985, and it consists of a bunch of uh, what we'll call conferences. You can think of them as four, typically on a specific topic. And we, we have two about politics and current events. Uh, one explicitly allows personal attacks, and the other explicitly forbids them. And mm -hmm. so to the, to the example you get about saying uh, you're a racist, right, uh, in the uh, conference called current, no, called politics is the one that does not allow person acts. You cannot say a person is a person is a racist unless you have evidence of racist actual behavior by that person. However, can you say their argument is racist. Yeah, yes, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. You can you can say uh, the uh the idea that you're putting forth is uh, racist. And though, though some of the people, the well is full of very uh, sharp, almost pettifogging, lawyeristic, uh, rabbinical type argumentation, which is actually a lot of fun. Uh, they'll say, well, there's, I would say, for instance, there's four kinds of racism. You know, there is. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, all, I'm all for detail as a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sure. so, so, so if someone says racism, so what do you mean by racism? So there'll be some yeah. pressure on that argument. But you can't say a person is a racist unless you have proof of their racist action, but you can critique the idea. So, and again, this is jurisprudence. It's built up. You, over you, you can also years. critique clusters. Like, like you can critique Charles Murray's entire project as racist not just one particular argument. I, 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 want, I, want, I want to step in a little bit here. Yeah, sorry. Um, because, Aaron, I think your, your argument, because you addressed it to me and Jim directly, and I think it's a, I think it's a valid argument that I would like to address because it's talking mm -hmm. about sort of platforming, ethics, and it feels like, a, and I, I, we've talked about me coming on your podcast, and I'd love to and maybe talk about this in more detail, but I feel like the platforming ethics conversation is a slightly mm -hmm. different one than than the Twitter argument and Elon Musk and where we're at at the moment. So I'd right. maybe like to kind of pull it back to that and, and, and Jim's proposal for kind of moderating and, and make, it, make it kind of more relevant to the Twitter example and what Elon might be kind of wrestling with. Because the, the big question yeah. or the big, the big thought that's coming through here is, despite the fact he's kind of potentially investing like 40, however many billion in buying Twitter, it seems that he hasn't really thought through some of these issues. But nope. it seems to me like from some of his tweets, there's a real naivety in terms of, and, and these are questions that because all of us have, have in some ways kind of been in charge of communities or in charge of platforms where this has come up as a real issue. I think a lot of people who comment on this, the comments I see in, in, in the comments thread are coming from a position of someone who's never probably had to wrestle with this and realize like, oh, actually maybe there are rules like that. Some of this, some of these arguments, some of these statements do have a real impact on people. And I have a certain responsibility as someone who is in charge of this space to do something about this. And I think this mm -hmm. maybe is the, is the journey that Elon may be going through. Um, but yeah, this sort of sense of a little bit of a naivety that you see in his tweets of sort of shooting from the hip, like someone willing to drop like 40 something billion of his own money without really seeming to think this through in any meaningful way. I think that would be really interesting to sort of dial into what what he may be letting himself in for and what mm -hmm. what how this applies to twitter in particular because we don't really yeah. have the same platform dynamics or hosting dilemmas that that maybe where you were going with that aaron sure yeah i'm i'm fine to set that aside for the moment um let me and let me let me speak again to the like optimism idealism side of things because i know that i'm going to come off as you know pro moderation and and sort of critical in various ways but i, I want you to understand i teach john stewart mill I, you know some of my best friends are john stewart mill i you know love the soaring rhetoric of on liberty and the idea that like you know the best way to defeat a good idea is, or bad ideas is a confrontation with a good idea right like 
I, I, I was raised liberal in all these kinds of ways. And it's been a hard road for me to recognize the limitations of an approach where, you know, I'm a scrapper. I love arguing. I could argue all day and it could be very easy for me to adopt the perspective that like arguing in this way is the highest form of engagement and everyone who doesn't do it is just a coward or something. But I don't think that's true. And I do think there are really genuine concerns about, um, you know, how we do moderation, how we do discourse. Um, and, and some of those concerns can go too far in the other direction. I don't know if we'll, we'll talk about civility porn, but like there can be a sort of uh, a downside to what Jim was describing in terms of spaces where there's like such an emphasis on civility that you're not, it like makes it very hard to even be critical of folks. But I, I think you're right. Let's focus in on the hard questions of the details of content moderation and talk about Jim's article some. Um, so as I mentioned, I was concerned because um, in reading through it, I wasn't sure, Jim, if it was just a not being not not seeing content as as harmful as I do, or I, I want to hear more about why you said that QAnon is equivalent to things like a religious belief structure and like why it should be allowed to just sort of run rampant in the same way that we would allow Catholic organizations to run rampant in social media? Because I think those are categorically different things. Um, but I'm curious to hear more about your perspective on that. Yeah, I thought about that quite carefully, right? I, I, as I said in the essay, I think QAnon is a very bad idea and exceedingly unlikely to be putting out true uh, you know, statements. But I would say the same exact thing about Christianity, astrology, and Marxist-Leninism. Uh, I am strongly opposed to all three, and I believe they do actual harm in the world and have done tremendous harm in the past, particularly Christianity and Marxist-Leninism. But uh, before the, before, for the reasons, the green shoots hypothesis that we don't, we can't say for sure uh, what mm -hmm. ideas we should allow into circulation or not, and nor should we have any confidence in giving that power uh, to a central authority. I am willing okay. to tolerate Catholicism, mm -hmm. which I was raised in, so I know the insides of that sucker, astrology, which causes people to make bad decisions all the time, Marxist-Leninism, which killed 100 million people in the 20th century, and QAnon, which seems like uh, ridiculous nonsense. Uh, and I would say they okay. do belong in the same bucket as uh, as meme plexes. Uh, they fit into the category of meme plexes. Or well, they're, some both, people... they're definitely all meme plexes. And I'm happy to talk about that. I think it's the, the difference in malignancy of them that I think we need to focus on. And so I would me... say, who's, to, who's uh -huh. to judge which one is the most malignant? I would put well, Marxist-Leninism so, yeah. at the top. <laughs> there, That's the worst of the four. But that's just my opinion, right? OK, so let me, let me, let me present you a case for why I think that's incorrect. And you brought up the who judges thing. We, we talked about it earlier as well. I did a Skeptics UK mag, the same people who I did the Monster Island article for. I, of course, then had to do an article called Who Decides in response to the endless question of who decides. And I sort of explained that I think that that can be is a genuine concern that we have to address, but is often raised in arguments strategically at various points as a kind of thought terminating cliche in the defense of free speech absolutism. So, you know, if we take the who decides problem as, you know, always something we have to solve before we start doing any of this, uh, I think I have, I think we, I worry that we never manage to do any content moderation. And since we all agree that we need content moderation, there's gonna have to be moderators of some sort and we can hash out the system you know, once we agree there needs to be kind of moderation. Um, I want to talk about the green shoots thing for a second, because I also worry that this is a version of like the Galileo gambit or that Sturgeon's yeah. law similarly is a kind of version of the Galileo's gambit, where if you really take seriously the idea that you can't know which is the one in a million good idea, you actually have to just let in everything, which includes, you know, Holocaust denial or something, because like, you never know, maybe Holocaust denial actually is the good idea. Well, let me, let me interject there. I would allow ho Holocaust denial. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a mistake. I think, I think it's, yeah. it's obviously bullshit. Uh, and, but not to but, everybody. It's not obvious to everybody is the problem. But that's OK. I mean, obvious is a subjective quality and I, many people experience I, it as plausible. It's the problem. I just, you know, I, you know, I'm, you know, under uh, under my reticence to touch viewpoint, uh, I would allow in uh, 
polite Ku Kluxers, if there is such a thing. I expect they couldn't resist uh, flinging around racial slurs. I think that just gets Monster Island is the problem. Like that's, nope, that's I don't just think the so. road back to Monster Island. I don't um, think so. So let me, let, me, let me talk about the QAnon part of it as well, because okay. I, wanted to, I want to make an argument for why okay. I think QAnon is uniquely is different. different. Let's do it. Because, Let's you know, it. I'm an atheist. I agree with you that like a lot of religions are harmful. Um, I am not a Marxist Leninist, um, though I agree with you that it has in various places caused various kinds of harm. The, to me, one key litmus test here is, can you be a devoted member of a particular idea or memeplex and live a good, fairly flourishing life, essentially, right? Um, basically, this is a question, is how, how malignant is your memeplex there? I think you can be a happy, flourishing Catholic who's fairly Catholic. I think you can be a happy, flourishing uh, Marxist Leninist who's, you know, I, I think so. Yeah, you know, obviously you can agree to disagree here, but like, I don't think you can be a happy, flourishing, fully devoted QAnoner. I think it's a kind of um, malignant meme plex, uh, a kind of uh, er conspiracism that pulls in so many things around it that once you're in that space, if you can't get back out of it, you're going to be miserable and scared and have a really bad life. And I think we see that play out over and over again for people in those communities. So, you know, I think we can distinguish between particularly dangerous, harmful ideas and say that those, wh whether they're big enough to be viewed as a point of view rather than just an idea that they need to be moderated. Um, and I do think that like some of the some of the stuff in, in the heterodox worldview makes it harder to acknowledge that that's something we need to do. There's a kind of atomistic approach to excising very small parts of the memeplex while letting the larger thing kind of run rampant. Yeah, I think I would just say I have to relatively categorically disagree. Uh, you know, one about the facts and, and the secondly about the standard. Uh, I actually know some QAnoners and most of them are jolly happy folks, right? And it's actually a hobby to them, kind of like uh, growing tulips or something, uh, reading the last drop, trying to interpret it and, you know, chatting with their friends in the back rooms of various bizarro online services. Uh, so I think the, you know, factually, the hypothesis that their lives are miserable uh, is, is not true. Have you ever uh, known cult members? Uh, I've known some ex-cult members, but I've never known a person when they were actively uh, caught in a cult. People uh, who are actively caught in these meme plexes often think that they're in a really good place. Like it's similar to being are. on a manic kick. Yeah, well, like, well, okay. So I think there's, I think we have to debate then, is there something like the difference between, you know, is everyone flourishing if they think they're flourishing or are some people wrong? And like, you know, if, if someone's doing heroin all day long, but they're really happy about it, like, would we not say they're living a life of flourishing? Okay. Might, yeah, not my I business. Mean, if they want to do that, it's your fine. business. I, I, think, I think that we should be <laughs> able to make value judgments. And that like, if we're not making value judgments at all, then like, why are we doing any content moderation? So again, the not, not a good distinction. I can okay. make the value judgment. I think, uh, you know, my friend Bill uh, sitting around doing fentanyl all day, watching porn and jerking off once a, a week when he can get a heart on. Uh, if, if that's what makes him happy, fine. But I will tell him if he asks me, I think you're on the wrong track, dude. And I would certainly raise my children not to go down that road. So you do think he's objectively wrong. You just don't I think want to he's get objectively wrong. It's not my okay, job. So, so that's, I, I'm not willing yeah. to tell him that I think he's objectively wrong. But right, I'm not but content willing. moderation is doing that at scale, right? It's being willing to say, no, you know, no, no, the, no, no, the no, no, KKK no. folks are objectively wrong. And while they can have their own space, they can't have our space. Uh, uh, right? let, me, let me make an, another distinction here, which is hugely okay. important. Um, in uh, which I did not get into in the article because we just ran out of time. There's another dimension, which I call domains, which is uh, in uh, groups like Facebook groups, subreddits, uh, private online communities that are put together for a purpose, or I call more generally a domain. It's perfectly reasonable for the moderators there to be very specific uh, about ruling things inbound and out of bounds. Uh, for instance, uh, the Harley Davidson subreddit uh, will vehemently whack you if you talk about Japanese motorcycles, right? And that's uh, their rule. That's the way it is. Their house, their rule. Uh, I would also give the example in our Game B online community, private community. Uh, uh, we have an explicit rule that says no anti Semites, no racists, and it goes into considerable detail on what that means. And within a private community organized for a purpose, uh, I believe that any uh, you know, no semicolons, you know, in the Cormac uh -huh. McCarthy group would be okay. But in the public squares where uh, I object, 
uh, to uh, uh, to these kinds of, of standards, and that's a completely different set okay. of criteria. And so, so, in so my you're own, against in my own, any content moderation on Twitter, for example. Uh, let's be very careful. The quorum, absolutely, and I think they don't have enough decorum regulation on Twitter. But no content moderation on Twitter. And as I again in my article, I lay out this dangerous, inherently truly dangerous stuff like how to make a bomb, how to commit suicide, uh, doxing, things of that ilk. I, but again, it has to be okay. very tight and very, but not any point of view at all, okay. including uh, advoca advocacy for overthrowing the United States government, so long as it didn't get to the to the level of being a violation of law, which would right. be con seditious conspiracy. If it's a, you know, for instance, uh, you know- Wait, hold I'm, on, can I, can I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna respond it, a little it, bit about that, they don't hop mind. It, hop it. Um, so, let me say a couple of things. First of all, the distinction between how to make a bomb and QAnon. If I'm being honest, I'm more concerned about people finding QAnon than how to make a bomb. Um, because most people don't want to make a bomb. They have no reason to make a bomb. They're not interested in making a bomb. And if they were interested, they're going to find that information online, right? QAnon, on the other hand, is a thing that puts people in a place where they want to make a bomb, where they want to put that bomb next to the American Capitol, for example, during a violent insurrection. So I, I think it's a bit of a downstream solution to an upstream problem to say, we're going to try to prevent people from getting access to how to build you know, a bomb, but we're not going to prevent them from having access to these really dangerous worldviews that make them want to make a bomb. So my, my opinion would be, I think it's reasonable to be doing that upstream kind of content moderation. I want to tie this back to the game uh, B stuff that you mentioned, because you talk about this in your maybe, article. Aaron, I think it oh, might yeah. be worth you sketching out what it is about QAnon that you find so um, sure. toxic. I mean, I, I, would, I would imagine that like, if you really dial into that and you really believe that there is a cabal of pedophiles, cannibals taking, like if you really, really believe that, then in a way that's about the most radicalizing thing you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it, and it grips people at a very visceral level. It kind of, yeah, yeah I, 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 can, I can completely see that QAnon at the moment is not, I, I wouldn't say is, is, is quite at the level of a major domestic terror threat, but you can certainly imagine when it, that it would be in the future. Is well, that yeah, so I think you're saying? Yeah, so I think it's important to understand. I know not everyone's going to agree with the DHS, but insofar as you, you, you think that they are somewhat clear eyed in their risk assessments, they have fairly consistently pointed to right wing domestic anti government terrorism as being one of, if not their highest concern, going back to the Trump years and before. Um, and I think that's reasonable. And when you look at things like Oklahoma City, I think I understand and the sovereign citizens and, and folks like that, you know where that where that's coming from. And QAnon is part of that meme plex. So for folks who aren't familiar, QAnon is not just a conspiracy about pedophiles and not just a conspiracy about cannibals. It's specifically a conspiracy about harvesting something called adrenochrome from children and then putting it into elite people to keep them alive longer. This is a version of what's called blood libel, uh, which is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory going back hundreds of years that uh, was the idea that Jews would steal Gentile children and use them to bake matzah and various other kinds of Jewish foods. It's a it's a conspiracy. It's one of the earliest sort of widely spread conspiracy theories in the modern world, along with like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It's the re one of the reasons that almost all conspiracism on a long enough timeline trends back towards anti-Semitism. And QAnon is a classic example of this. Many, I'm sure many, many people in QAnon have no idea that that is what it what they are engaged in and are, you know, nice people who think that they're just unraveling deep state conspiracy theories or something like that. But if you don't know that stuff, it makes you more susceptible when versions of that come along in the form of attacks on globalists, attacks on Bill Gates, attacks on vaccines, all of that stuff is more easily onboarded once you are in these kinds of spaces. So I, I think it's very difficult to overestimate the kind of risk that conspiracism plays in particular on the right right now and is going to continue to for the near future and that we don't have a good solution to this problem. But I, I think almost everyone I talk to who studies this blames Facebook 
significantly for the period of time when QAnon groups were not only allowed but heavily promoted by the algorithms because they were popular as a period in which many people who would have otherwise led healthy, flourishing lives got sucked into a conspiratorial cult and are now, you know, estranged from their family and stuff. It's just extremely harmful material. Let me give you the other side of that with the the, the exact mirror image, uh, which is uh, uh, wokeism and Black Lives Matter, right? Black Lives okay, Matter. But hold on. Before, before, we, before we talk about the other side of anything, can we agree on what I just said? Because I don't want to what about this conversation, okay. I think. All right. Let's QAnon is it. uniquely different from I would say Black not. Lives Matter or wokeness. But like, I want to make sure that you agree with me about what I just said about QAnon. All right. Uh, let me let's just think about that for a second. Uh, how does QAnon uh, differ from, let's say, uh, snake handling fundamentalist Christians in a small town in West Virginia? Scale. Uh, Scale uh, is your answer. <laughs> well, uh, the number of fundamentalists in the United States is probably larger. But not by snake handlers. Fact, it's maybe not, not snake, snake handlers. handlers. <laughs> maybe not snake handlers. But QAnon has not, as far as I know, has not actually uh, uh, erupted into actual violence. I mean, it's stupid idea. January uh, 6th is one example of QAnon based violence for sure. Um, but also I think it's important to understand that the recent spike in everyone on the right calling people groomers is the mainstreaming of QAnon's pedo conspiracism. It's the it's the safe version for people who don't want to be seen as QAnoners, but it is absolutely as dangerous in terms of what um, David was just saying that like if you tell people that there is a cabal coming for their children, there will be violence and there has been and there's been death threats against people at, 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 at on school boards there's been people who've had to leave their their area because people keep harassing them because they're teaching you know pedo conspiracy stuff in schools that there is real harm being done and i feel like you're you, you see this as sort of like another fun debate game or something and not like people's lives being ruined by this it happens, right? Uh, safetyism should be uh, eschewed, right? Uh, the world is built on fairly extreme events, uh, and we just have to tolerate that as the price. For instance, I am a strong Second Amendment uh, freedom person, as you might imagine, right? And people say, well, what about- pro-gun control and how uh, fine uh, are people owning guns and new many hunters, but- yeah, I don't, I don't think we should just be allowing everyone to just run rampant with whatever guns they want. Like, I think we actually clearly value moderation on that front, too. Yeah, I'm again, I'm, I would say a sensible moderator. I believe you should have uh, rules about carrying of guns in public. Uh, so that puts me gets the NRA after my ass. Let's, but on the other hand, not, on your private property, have any gun you to, want. Right? <laughs> let's, let's not get distracted onto guns. I think to summarize Aaron's point, Jim, his I think his point is that your division between decorum and viewpoint moderation doesn't really hold up when you've got these toxic perspectives that could potentially lead to violence like, like QAnon, that, though, that that division doesn't really, a, a, a hard and fast rule around decorum does not take care of that radicalizing force. Yeah, let's that. drill into that. Let's just drill into that. Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, what we miss is my third category, which is inherently dangerous content. Because uh, decorum, I think we can cleanly distinguish from the QAnon discussion. Uh, you could certainly talk sure. about yeah, QAnon absolutely. in a, a decorous fashion, and you would not. Yeah, I don't think we have that much disagreement on the, the decorum side of things. Maybe a small uh, detail, yeah, but I, yeah. I don't think that's part of the issue here. And I think the the question is uh, uh, in my third middle category of. Uh, inherently and clearly dangerous uh, mm -hmm. content. Uh, and, you know, where I give the example of poisons, uh, you know, suicide guides uh, and uh, bomb making uh, mm -hmm. and doxing, uh, you know, doxing could go in decorum. It's, it's not clear whether it goes in decorum or goes in, uh, you know, just inherently bad content. Uh, and then I would draw the line there and not include any viewpoint you say that there are some viewpoints that are as you know that are of the of like kind uh mm. to bombs poisons and suicide instructions and should go in the inherently dangerous content box and my position is that uh no that uh, viewpoints are a different uh ontological class and mm -hmm. that if we want to regulate viewpoints that's a third category that one has to think about and probably under you know the far exception rule which uh, some people refer to as the uh, uh popper paradox of tolerance there is 
at some point a limit. But I would also say, as I've said on the internet many times, please don't quote Popper's uh, paradox of tolerance unless you've actually read Open Society and Its Enemies and realize that this is a uh, rather uh, narrow, extreme uh, exception to Popper's general argument in favor of an open society. So, uh -huh. I would, so I, I, yeah. at the end of the day, there are probably some viewpoints that I would be tolerable uh, to uh, censor or to moderate away, but they would have to be like, uh, you know, way more extreme and have gotten a lot farther in their progress towards actually threatening to choke off uh, freedom than QAnon has. Okay, yeah. So let me respond to that. I mean, I, I think mean, I, let, let me let me just ask a, fa a counterfactual, mm -hmm. Jim. If if say QAnon did erupt into more violence, there were more. Uh, it was clearly a motivating factor in violent actions beyond what we've seen so far. You could have like the guy who went to the the pizza restaurant and shot it up after PizzaGate, or you can argue how much it was influenced on. There's January been some 6th. parents who've killed their children over it. Yeah, 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 I would say. Yeah. Put a, here's a, here's so a. Would, uh, would, you, would you would you then change your mind on 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 that kind of viewpoint moderation if it if it was clearly seen to be more of a threat? Yeah, I would say if it uh, let's we'll play a little bit of game here. If it uh, killed a million people in the United States, I'd say yes. Uh, and I would say a lower floor, as we know from uh, uh, the found experiment, uh, if it killed twenty people and did two billion dollars worth of damage, then we probably shouldn't ban it. Uh, and that would be Black Lives Matter. Uh, uh, which is another kind of uh, false conspiracy theory that has erupted and produced lots of actual harm. Uh, so we are willing to tolerate uh, harm at that level. Uh, and so that's we know that that's tolerated by our society. Uh, and so somewhere between uh, Black Lives Matter and a million dead people is probably where the line is. And I'm not quite sure where it is, but I will acknowledge that it does exist. Um, so let me say... First of all, from, from a studying conspiracism standpoint, I think there's an important argument that Black Lives Matter and wokeness, while they may cause harms, while they may be problematic in various ways, I don't think they qualify as conspiracism in the way that QAnon qualifies as conspiracism and that they do not posit the existence of a they, a group who are coordinating this situation in the kind of way that conspiracism um, I think has to, if it's going to count as actual conspiracism and not just being really unhappy about the state of things. I think if you look at like postmodern, you know, if you look at postmodern critiques of power, for example, they are explicitly anti-conspiratorial because what they're saying is, no, look, you're wrong. There doesn't need to be a shady back room for everything to be terrible. It can just be terrible. Yeah, yeah, um, so, but let me, I want to talk about the, the point of view problem because- I mean, there, there will yeah. be, a lot of people would say that actually that CRT and Black Lives Matter do pose a, a particular group of people like- I do think there are versions of nerd. them. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to respond to that because I think a lot of people watching will be saying, oh, hang on, yeah, there is a there is a, a group of people being mm. demonized by these protests and also by the kind of the ideology behind it, and that's whiteness or white people. Yeah, no, uh, BLM and, and, and wokeness, uh, and in fact, the uh, Frankfurt people were pretty explicit about this, fell, falls into the class of open conspiracy, uh, uh, much like Game B does, right? Which is, uh, you know, we are an open conspiracy. We put our ideas out, hoping that they'll be adopted and turn into a vibrant memeplex. And, yeah, I really, uh, I really want to talk about Game B because I think it's a good example of the problem. I think that I have with your perspective here, um, but I think it's important to understand. So, if you look, for example, at like Derek Bell's um, Silent Covenants. Uh, which is something that folks like James Lindsay will often point to as CRT's beating heart of conspiracism, where Bell points to genuine, and this is a problem with, with like just doing conspiratorial communication. I was talking with David about this earlier, that like in the modern world, you're trying to explain the problem of conspiratorial thinking when there are well-documented conspiracies that hurt a lot of people. And like, how do you help people distinguish between conspiratorial thinking that's bad and like cons the skepticism that naturally arises when you learn about things that the CIA or other groups have done. That is a, a really significant challenge that is part of our current epistemic crisis. But I think if you read Silent Covenants, Derek Bell is not a conspiracy theorist. He's saying there has been a specific 
playing out of these projects, some of which involved explicit conspiratorial events like the ending of um, Reconstruction. Um, and that like a lot of their arguments are meant, a lot of the systemic critique arguments are meant to explain how a system where everyone thinks they are good people doing the right thing can still have bad outcomes. And so that to me is the opposite of the kind of conspiracism that says there's a group of people who are bad and mean to do bad things. Now, there are versions of anti-whiteness uh, CRT stuff that I think absolutely go into, go in the wrong direction and go into like, you know, white people are part of a giant conspiracy in this way and it's really bad. And, and they're like, they're bad because of that. And I don't think, I think that's a mistake and we should, we should correct people when they go in that kind of direction. But we shouldn't assume that whenever someone talks about white supremacy, they mean an organized conspiracy of white supremacy. What they mean is a reproducing memeplex, essentially. They mean a system that is perpetuating itself in individuals who do not see themselves as being part of that memeplex. But I, okay, I really do want to talk about Game because I have a specific point here about this. I that, come, that like that like is a concern about similar to the QAnon thing. Um, so you said in game in your game B groups you don't allow anti-Semitism. Um, my understanding was, and, and this comes up in your article, your groups were shut down for a period of time. Um, and in the article, you don't say why, which is confusing to me because my understanding is it was because these groups were specifically infiltrated by proprietarians, which are a group. So, give, so, me a time, yeah. give me Hold a timeline on, on that. Give, give me the facts on that. Uh, okay, but let me just let me just make sure I under, okay. you know, lay out my, what my concern is here. Okay. okay. Um, in in I, I believe in David's article about the proprietarians and his discussions with Jordan Hall, he specifically highlights that proprietarians were deliberately infiltrating plan a uh, game B groups as well as other heterodox groups for the sake of recruiting. Um, and that was why y'all initially got flagged. Now, I could be wrong about the flagging side of things. Feel free to correct me if I, if I am, but even if that's not the reason y'all were shut down, I think proprietarians, proprietarians present a real problem for your view because they can come in and say, well, look, we're just a point of view yes, our point of view involves anti-Semitism, but it's part of a larger point of view. I think at the end of the day, what we're debating here is, can we, can we just censor or moderate memes in isolation? Or do we sometimes have to moderate meme plexes? And I think the reality is sometimes we have to moderate meme plexes like propertarianism. Yeah. So, so yeah, think, please correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah, it was the, the timelines were separate by about 18 months. Yeah, we were indeed infiltrated explicitly uh, we now discovered because we had a, somebody who defected uh, by the proprietarians which was kind of a crackpot neo-nazi explicitly anti-semitic uh, group and they had uh, lurked for a few months and then they all activated at once presumably by some uh, signal and within a, a three or four days we expelled them all and that was a month a year and a half before the facebook uh, incident. We we still do have no idea. Uh, we get uh, my best guess, and I've talked about this quite extensively on podcasts and with AI people, is that it was a accidental side effect of uh, Facebook playing with its anti QAnon algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. It ha it happened the day after of Biden's inaugural, where a lot of people reported uh, strange uh, uh, moderation actions. Uh, and so uh, there was no fights going on in the Game B group. The proprietarians had been booted, you know, a year and a half before. Had you cleared uh, out any of their anti, all their anti-Semitic content as well, I assume? Well, they never had any anti-Semitic content. Oh, I see. Uh, they didn't actually uh, post anti-Semitic content. I'm, well, well, so here's why I ask, because... They might I'm, have, I'm, like, a random yeah. comment or something. But, you know, there was certainly no uh, significant uh, anti-Semitic or, or explicitly racist uh, anti, they are particularly anti-black racist. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me let me mention. I, I understand where you're coming from there. As, as someone who works in skeptic debunking communities, there's a problem, and this is you know something that we have to. We can, if we want to ever talk about policy of moderation, we have to talk about why AI AI moderation alone is never going to be the solution because it can't distinguish not only between things like satire and stuff, but also between. Um, promoting of an idea and debunking of an idea. So a lot of my content debunker friends have trouble where their their material gets taken down because it's viewed as being pro, you know, anti-vaxxer stuff or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen um, that happen. So, you know, like, it's, it's quite possible that like your community could also have run afoul of that um, to some degree or another. I don't know 
uh, the Both details on that. The right, timing it, doesn't it, look like it. Uh, timing looks like it. If it did at some stati some statistical anomaly, we sort of look like QAnon, even though we're the other extreme from QAnon. Uh, uh, it's the, the only one that sort of fits the evidence and the timing and what was going on, and that other people were seeing very anomalous uh, viewpoint censorships uh, at so, exactly the same time. If I can say, um, and maybe it's a small point, but I think it's for someone who works in the conspiracism world, it's a meaningful point to me. I would have loved if you'd included that in your article. If you'd said, we don't know why exactly. We think it may have been a glitch with the algorithms and that it got corrected. And this is a good reason for more human throwing money at human based correctives to AI moderation, right? Having a rapid check system that a human being can look at this thing and say, okay, this is not actually bad. Put it back on the thing as fast as possible. I think that's really, really important. But when I read your article, that section to me feels like it promotes implicitly a kind of conspiracism because it's sort of as like, you know, we never found out. We don't know why. And maybe that means that there were more malicious reasons than just an algorithmic glitch. I think it's mm -hmm. valuable to say the most likely reason is an algorithmic glitch and it got fixed and not leave that kind of open ended for people to wonder kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, uh, you know, yeah. if I had uh, the editor probably would have cut it because the damn paper was too long anyway. But uh, sure. it's absolutely. Uh, and, and that's to... just a guess. Yeah, I'd love to, we, we, we need to wrap up um, now, and I'd love to just sort of ask for any sort of closing thoughts that we haven't uh, covered with regards specifically to kind of what Elon Musk is likely to be wrestling with, um, with regards Twitter that we haven't expressed yet. And I mm -hmm. wonder, Jim, if you've got any more thoughts from your article that you haven't, that you haven't kind of got out that you might want to share. Uh, uh you know, yeah. uh, I think this is one where Aaron and I would agree is that the, you know, late in my article, I talk about the fact that moderation has to be fair and transparent and that any uh, computer uh, done moderation needs to be appealable to a human within 24 hours. And I offered, I'll admit, clever homebrew idea to have a second appeal on a market driven basis, et cetera. <laughs> People should read it. Uh, no money, no money involved. I was opposed yeah. to that one. <laughs> oh, but, I, I, but anyway, but neither here as soon as you involve money, you create two worlds for rich people and poor people. And that's not a good but, but notice I have a fix for that too by allowing uh, okay. syndication of your appeal. So even a person with okay. no money can make money. So anyway, uh, uh, so I think we're in agreement there. And I and I believe Elon has also said some things that indicate he understands that as well. Uh, but I, I do think the one issue, I this was said at the very beginning, is that if Elon does not understand that we have to have decorum moderation he's gonna blow his $44 billion, that uh, Twitter will turn into a dumpster fire. Uh, everybody with uh, who's trying to have actual intelligent conversations will leave because there'll be troll armies, there'll be uh, you know vicious uh, hecklers trying to stop every discussion and that he will just have wasted his money and uh, Twitter will turn into 4chan, right? Uh, so that's, that's my number one uh, takeaway. Elon, if you're listening, focus, <laughs> first on decorum moderation. If you don't do that, you're going to lose. Then uh, we can engage in the discussion of where content moderation should be drawn. Okay. So I agree that um, he's going to have a lot of challenges. I don't, I think I have a little more complex of a take on uh, the levels of the different challenges there. Um, I, I agree with you that like he needs to maintain current levels of decorum moderation. I think he has a hard problem you know, and we didn't get into the decorum side of it because we mostly agree, but like there are hard cases like people like James Lindsay who are really, really toxic on Twitter. But do you are they, you know, breaking breaching decorum enough that it's worth removing them for that reason? And there I actually lean towards like, no, like I think that's not that's not really a, a way to solve that particular problem. Um, so there are hard problems of decorum, I think, still. There's also I just want to emphasize, I think. He can't just be worried about decorum. He has to be worried about specific individuals. So I will say, you know, Elon, if you're listening, don't put Donald Trump back on Twitter. I know you think this is a way to make money and it is a way to make money, but it is a bad way to make money and you will hurt lots of people in the process. So he, you know, he, there are certain individuals, him, Alex Jones, folks like that, where I think we just have to acknowledge that the world is a better place if they don't have access to Twitter and, and agree that we're not going to let them come back on and do the thing that they did before. Um, and then I think, you know, our debate about meme plexes, I think he needs to be aware of the way that QAnon, the way that white Christian nationalism, other kinds of things 
can can gain a pretty strong toehold in these kinds of spaces. I'm not sure the solution is always to like mass ban or something, but I don't think that, you know, I think that has to be a part of the conversation from the beginning. And the reality is, I think if he does these things, all of the people who are excited about him will be unhappy and he will not be happy because they're not happy and that will be hard for everyone. But so I don't I don't have a lot of hope on uh, what what feels to me a very audience captured decision, but hopefully, um, hopefully we can help a little bit. Awesome. I'm sure that um, the comment thread is going to like everything that you've said, Aaron, and there will be no one who disagrees with you about um, <laughs> about keeping Trump uh, off off Twitter. I I don't. I mean, like I'll I'll argue that point all day. I think that one's a low hanging fruit. Yeah, all, why not? Alongside I'll, the other stuff. Yeah. Let me give you my answer on that one, which is before I let Trump on, I would uh, carefully go through the decorum rules. I would expand them considerably from what they currently are, which they're surprisingly skimpy on Twitter, which is one of the reasons it's the dump dumpster fire that it is. Then I'd let Trump back on. And if he violated the, the new precise uh, decorum rules, I'd boot him. And if he didn't, I'd let him stay why there's a 100 percent certainty you will have to ban him again 110 percent that you he will not last any any extended period of time under stricter like he didn't last before like the only but, reason but he then, lasted but then, because but they that's didn't have fine a then isn't it what, what's the problem yeah. then aaron you, well, what's yeah, the point of putting him back on just to take him off again i guess is my question well it's the it's the demonstrate because he'll, he'll, have, he'll have then taken himself off rather than exactly. took himself off the, so we, he took himself off the first time why are we why are we we, we don't know now because we don't he was not kicked for any really uh, for an explicit violation of the terms of services as they existed at that time. Uh, it was an arbitrary uh, uh, ex post uh, action. And so I, I say, let him hang himself, give him like a smart parent does with a obstreperous nine year old, give enough rope to hang himself and then say, see, I told you. Uh, I think you're setting yourself up for a disaster. And, and at the end of the day, you're going to have to ban him and people will still hate you. And there will have been nothing gained, in my opinion. Just, well, just my, view, I, my perspective. I think we'll have to differ no. on that one. It's been yeah. a good conversation. I enjoyed it, Aaron. Nice Cheers. to meet you. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with you in the future. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, this was a yeah, really excellent exchange of views and look forward to continuing the conversations with both of you at some point very soon. Very good. Thanks very much.